Welcome to our session. And um, today we are going to talk about prototypes. So it's uh, in front end track. And it has, the presentation has several parts. So one part will be about front end, and another part will be about, a little bit about back end. Actually, how to communicate to your back end developers about ideas we are going to talk about. But let me start with the introduction. Um, my name is Yuri. Uh, Gerasimov. I'm a back-end developer. Currently, I'm working as architect, team leader, and this is my colleague. Hey, everyone. My name is Morten Christofferson. I'm uh, the user experience lead at uh, FFW. And um, just a quick introduction to FFW for those of you who haven't heard of us before. Um, we're a global digital agency. We have uh, offices across the globe, uh, 11 uh, in 11 countries from US to uh, Vietnam. And we're a full service uh, digital agency. We have about uh, 420 full-time employees and about uh, 20 offices worldwide. So as uh, Yuri just said, today we'll be um, talking about these four things. Uh, so there's kind of two parts to this presentation. The first part uh, we'll be talking about is um, designing in browser and uh, prototyping. So I'll kind of be walking you through uh, designing in browser, what is, what is it and, and why would you do it? Um, and I'll be talking about the prototyping setup that we're using at FFW for our designers. Then uh, Yuri's gonna take over from that and talk about how we uh, work with implementing <laughs> prototypes in uh, Drupal 7 and also a bit about uh, Drupal 8, what to expect next. So between each of these four sections, we'll have some time for uh, questions, so we don't have to kind of add everything on to, to the end because it's, it's a lot of ground we'll, we'll be covering today. All right. So designing in browser, what is it and, and why should we uh, even do it? So I'm gonna start off with, uh, with the what part. So designing in browser essentially means uh, designing websites directly in the browser using HTML, CSS, JavaScript, instead of using apps such as um, Photoshop or Fireworks or Sketch. So let me, let me expand a little bit on that. So for, for a long time, uh, designing websites has been about uh, creating static mockups. So mockups created in, in Photoshop, in Fireworks, in, in Sketch in, in this instance. Um, but uh, designing in browser really is about kind of replacing these static mockups with designing directly in code. Um, so designing directly in the browser with HTML, CSS, JavaScript. So in the industry as a whole, in the web industry, there's kind of been a general trend um, among designers to begin kind of learning some, some of, some, a bit of coding and kind of moving in this direction. Probably a lot of you in here are familiar with this trend. Uh, maybe a lot of you are already working in this way. Um, and uh, at FFW, it's uh, a kind of a, a trend or an approach we've been moving towards for uh, the past couple of years, really. Um, so the way we work with it is that we have our designers working closely with front-end developers actually writing up these uh, prototypes, um, hand coding them uh, in the framework that I'm gonna be talking about a bit later. Um, so with actual code written by hand that our designers can kind of hand off to our front-end developers and hand off to implementation. So obviously this is a, a new technique and it has kind of new requirements for uh, designers, new requirements for uh, the workflows but it also has kind of a tonch of benefits to beginning, to beginning to kind of bridge the, the uh, design and, and code. So uh, that, that really brings me to the why. So why, why would we want to do this? We have this perfectly fine process that we've been working with for, for a long time. Why would we want to begin kind of mixing up front end development and, and design? So I have four benefits that I, I want to walk you through today. So why would we want to design in browser? So those benefits are precision, consistency, interaction, and transparency. So we'll get started with, with precision. So when we design a responsive website for a long time, it's been about designing uh, these nice pixel perfect mockups in, uh, in probably around three sizes, maybe more, maybe uh, less. Um, 
but uh, yeah, designing like a mobile tablet desktop size is, is pretty pretty traditional way to do it. And uh, it works nice, but it also has a lot of limitations uh, because the challenge is that we don't really know um, what's going to go on in between these different breakpoints, or really these kind of uh, images, screenshots of, of the overall experience. Um, so the challenge is that all of the, these things that uh, developers have to kind of take into account when they have to begin to implement designs, so things such as is this actually a responsive design or is it an adaptive design? Uh, are we using relative units or is it uh, static units? What kind of breakpoints are we working with? Is it like a max width site or is it in like a, a fixed width container? And also like the flow of the content. So, uh, and I've been guilty of this myself, but I don't know how many times I've seen designers uh, design these perfect mockups with these like fixed height elements. And then you throw like uh, an extra line of text in there and it just breaks the full layout, right? And the designers get really mad at the developers. <laughs> And um, all of these factors are something that we need to take into account and something that designers like to have control of, but, but they usually don't, don't, they usually tend to miss it with these static mockups. So what, um, what prototyping or designing in browser does is it kind of gives us the control and the precision over all of these details. And it also really forces designers to, to take these details into account. Um, about the responsive behavior of, of the things we're designing. So that's the first benefit of designing in browser. Let's uh, continue with consistency. So as a designer on like a large scale web project with the traditional approach to designing mockups, um, it can be kind of a, a challenge to, to keep track of all the components that you're designing. Um, and to main maintain kind of consistency across our site. Let's just take a, a really simple uh, example with, with a button. So it's, it's pretty easy to design a, a button. You choose a nice typography, you put it in a box, and because obviously we've worked with web before, we know that it's a good idea to just choose like a padding and, and it, it's gonna work nicely even when we change the text. Um, the problem is that in Photoshop or Sketch, it rarely kind of works nicely, um, even if you use kind of some of the tools available in those programs. It rarely works nicely once you start kind of uh, iterating and the project grows and the, and the iterations kind of pile up and the risk at least of introducing kind of inconsistencies in your design grows. So maybe you know you, you had to change the text on the button and suddenly these paddings are no longer what they're meant to. And so we start introducing these inconsistencies. Uh, and it takes a lot of time to clean that up. I mean the problem, I mean inconsistencies, you can get rid of those but it takes a lot of time as a designer to go through all those files and, and clean all of that up. So um, one problem that also kind of arises then is that what if at the end of the project we decide that we want to kind of add a border radius to the button. We want to add rounded corners. Now we have to go through all of the files that we've used and we have to update it. And even if we're using something like smart objects or symbols in Sketch, we still have, go, have to go through all those files and export them again. So the good thing about designing in browser, about designing with code, is that we, we're able to really easily introduce consistency. I mean, we just have all of our variables, all of our code in like one class for the button. And if we want to add a border radius, well, we just add it and it automatically gets updated everywhere in the prototype. So it, it, it's really a, a way to kind of allow us to split all of these components that we're designing into these reusable uh, components. So yeah, that's the second benefit of designing in browser. We get reusable styles, reusable components. So the third benefit is interaction. So designing with Designing a digital product, designing a website, obviously is about more than designing what it looks like. It's about designing how it works, it's about how it feels to interact with the website. That's the purpose of, of a website in most cases, interaction. So um, we find that it's kind of a, a paradox really to begin to design something as dynamic as a website with something as static as, as a mock-up. Because a mock-up essentially is, is a pretty picture, right? Um, and the problem with pretty pictures is not that they're pretty or that they're pictures, it's that they don't react, pictures don't react to, to users. Um, 
So when we design in browser, when, we're, when we do prototyping, we work with the interaction design of the solution. So we have to take into account how things we act to user input. And um, we can work with that in, in various ways, but three ways uh, that are really important um, I want to walk you through now. So the first is user flows. So designing in browsers, designing in browser allows us to, to take into account the flows of the website that we're designing. So even though we can talk about it and think about it for a long time, do extensive information architecture, nothing kind of beats being able to actually use that flow that you're building. So is that user journey, is that logical? Can people find their way through that checkout flow that you've designed? Uh, with prototypes, we don't have to kind of guess. We can just, you know, test it, have, try it out. We're, we're actually testing it all the time um, as we kind of go through, through the flows. So the, the second one is one that uh, often, in my experience, tends to be forgotten when we're, uh, we're designing uh, with static mockups. Uh, so things like feedback. So what does an error message look like? A confirmation message, a hover state, an active state, all these things that are really important to making an interface feel uh, responsive, feels like it's, it's reacting to your input. And all of these things can be really difficult to, to get around to when you're just designing with static mockups. Because obviously you don't use the static markups yourself, you look at them. You don't try clicking that button. So you never, you, you know, you forget that you need to add an error message until the developer tells you, you didn't design an error message and we're all about to launch tomorrow. Obviously Yuri gives me uh, more of a heads up than that. <laughs> and um, the third one I wanna walk through is transitions and animations. So probably a lot of you are aware that transitions and animations have again become kind of increasingly important in recent years. We're seeing a lot of it uh, in web design today. Uh, and it is really important um, because transitions and animations allow us to communicate context to users. So allow us to communicate context about the various states of objects. Just something simple like clicking an image and having it open up in, in, an, uh, in, an, uh, in a light box or an overlay how does that interaction work? Does it just appear right in your face when you click the image? Or do we have like a nice simple transition that just makes the user aware what's going on? Like we're opening up this image for you that you just clicked. So it's simple stuff, but stuff that's really important for uh, the overall user experience and stuff that you can't really design in a mockup. So that's the third benefit in interaction. Fourth one is um, transparency. And it's maybe on, on kind of a, a higher uh, level than, than uh, kind of the technicalities of designing and implementing. So uh, maybe some of you have seen design processes that go something uh, like this. So we have a client that gives you some kind of input that could be like a brief or maybe it's a workshop or it's some kind of research that's already been done. And they feed it to this design black box. So this magical black box where designers sit, you know, because designers are uh, these magnificent uh, creatures that sit in their own little universe and they come up with some magic solution and they just give it to the clients after two months of waiting. The problem is that the clients don't always agree with these magical solutions that the designers come up with in their black box. So uh, to kind of solve this challenge, um, what we do at FFW with prototyping and designing in browser is that we, from day one, we invite the clients into this design black box and have them be part of the design process. And one of the ways we do that is by giving them a URL, a link to the prototype from, from day one, basically, so they can see as we're kind of building out the design, they can follow along. They can see when it's broken, they can see when it's unbroken again, and, and they can kind of follow along in the process. And it's really a nice way of also anchoring that project with, with the client. Um, another really nice thing about that is that the client uh, no longer is kind of forced to looking only at the visual design, which they often do. They often put on the designer hat when they're just looking at mockups because that's what they can kind of relate to. Then they look at the, the details of typography, colors. Oh, is that background image the right one? I think we need to use the other one. So things that really doesn't matter in like a design process. Uh, they should be looking at the interaction and the flow of the, of the website. So. Um, with prototypes, the client automatically becomes a user. So they can go to that link and they automatically start using the website. So they uh, interact with the interface. That also has kind of a nice added benefit, which, which is uh, related to the overall 
uh, process. So traditionally, design has been very siloed, kind of in one end of a, of a full uh, process. And uh, theming and, and QA has been very much siloed in the other end, which puts a huge amount of pressure also on, on QA right before launch. Um, and fixing stuff like you know, small visual bugs sometimes can be you know, down-prioritized because there are more important uh, things at, right before a launch of a project, right? Um, but the good thing about designing uh, in browser is that we kind of split this up. So the theming and design kind of overlaps, really, and development can actually start while we're still working on designs. And QA becomes much more kind of spread out because we're actually starting QA from day one, basically. This should actually be from, from day one, I guess, with the client because they are, con they are constantly testing the website we're building for them. And we're constantly testing it ourselves. <coughs> so that's um, transparency. So that's the four benefits of uh, designing in browser that I wanted to kind of present today. So we're going to take a, a, a minute here for any questions. Yes. So the question is, do we have any designers that do style tiles or anything like that to design on typography, colors? And, and yes, we do. So obviously, uh, prototyping and designing in browser is, is part of a whole design process. So we don't just you know, uh, start a project by designing in browser. We obviously have a process that goes before that by you know, determining information architecture and, and business goals and all of these things. And as part of kind of starting up the design process, we also do uh, style tiles is one thing we, we tend to do. Uh, but we also work with mock-ups still. So uh, I'm not uh, suggesting that today that you uh, delete Photoshop and Sketch and all that stuff from your computers, but I'm suggesting that uh, mock-ups should be meant for at the beginning of a project, maybe doing two, three mock-ups of like a front page or some kind of idea to set the, the visual style. So to decide on typography, colors, and it can always be iterated on later. But it gives a nice, uh, nice sense of kind of security a certainty for the client as well to have seen just kind of some direction before we move into browser. But we only do very few mock-ups or something like style tiles works nicely as well. And then we move into designing uh, directly in the browser. Yes? Uh, any tools for? Yep, I will get to that in right a second. There'll be a ton of tools we'll be, we'll be talking about. Yes? Mm -hmm. So the question is, do our designers know uh, JavaScript, for example, to work with like uh, animations and carousels and transitions? And the question is, uh, the answer is uh, some of them do. So uh, we, we uh, yeah, we have what we call them hybrid designers because they're kind of designers and they're kind of uh, front-end developers and it, it also sounds cool, so that's an added benefit. Uh, but, um, but yeah, uh, we have designers that do both kind of uh, that are traditionally designers but that have you know, worked more and more with kind of front-end technologies and that's hugely uh, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Uh, but we also have designers working with this process that, that have no knowledge of, of JavaScript, but that just can't get, then get teamed up with a front-end developer or with one of these hybrids. So instead of having the one hybrid, you just have a team of two people working really closely together. So obviously it gives new requirements to our designers, but also to the front-end developers that have to work in this workflow because they have to put on their designer hats as well and kind of be, be willing to iterate quickly with uh, a designer. So it can work both ways. You don't need to find these hybrids. You can, you can set up teams with, of a designer and a front-end developer that are kind of the design team at the beginning of, of the project. Yeah, so um, uh, the question was, what do you think about apps like Avacode that can, can generate code? Um, so we, we've used uh, apps such as that as well. There are a ton of them. Uh, we've used uh, one called Webflow um, and still use that in, in, in some instances. And uh, it can work nicely. Uh, the problem, and I'll, I'll get back to that, with, with these kind of apps 
and why we try to get over to kind of hand coding with our framework is that at some point we have to hand it off to our front end developers. And we want to be able to reuse as much of the code base as we possibly can with, uh, with that handoff. And, and obviously we could set up a whole process around something like Webflow, but we don't want to do that. So we'd rather kind of have our own setup that kind of feeds into Drupal development. Yes? Yeah, so the question is, does the client sometimes get too involved with this process and, and kind of want to decide the colors? And I want to add rounded uh, border radius to that, but. Hmm. So there, there are kind of two answers to that question, I would say. One is that, in my experience, actually, it's off, most often the opposite kind of happens. When we show mock-ups to clients, they start talking about, uh, you know, colors and typography. But when we show them prototypes, they start clicking around and using it, and they actually start talking about the things that matter. And I'm a designer, I still think typography and rounded corners matter, but you know, whether a button should have rounded corners or not, that's not the important part of designing a website at all. That rarely changes anything, really, uh, in terms of the user experience. So uh, often we find that they actually start you know, using the product instead, so that becomes the focus. So the other, uh, answer to, to that question is that uh, instead of having like the big reveal at the end, we, we try to, to really get away from those big reveals because you know going into the black box and then you come out and show the, the mock-ups because when you do those big reveals, you often get a uh, really bad reaction because maybe you've been working in a totally wrong direction and you, and you basically have to start over. So by involving the client from the beginning, they do become part of the process, but it's also obviously then important to kind of set boundaries. With, with a client, that you have to do that basically. And, and they know that as well, it's in their best interest. So even though you're working closely with the client, you have to still make sure that everyone on the team is aware of their role, right? So, hmm? It's about educating the client, yes. I mean, it's about making the client aware that they're paying obviously for your expertise as a designer or a developer. And obviously you take client input into account. But you have to, you have to just tell the client if they're suddenly you know, putting on the designer's hat and telling you that uh, that uh, you know that button should have rounded corners or whatever, and you have to kind of be able to set those those boundaries with the client. So it's about collaboration, and obviously there can be challenges. It's not always a perfect collaboration. It's not a perfect world, um, but I think there's definitely ways to kind of make sure you don't get those problems by just you know communicating well throughout the the project. And prototypes really help with that. Yes. Yeah, so um, as I was saying, the, the question was, can you tell us a little bit more about the communication process? So uh, as I was saying, obviously we don't start off with just designing prototypes. So it's not like we get a brief and then we call and we set up the deal with the client and then we just start prototyping. Obviously there's a whole process that goes, goes kind of before prototyping. So we have you know, all kinds of uh, workshops and, and uh, kind of meetings both on like a strategic level, figuring out business goals, figuring out you know, user goals, setting, KPIs for the website, all this stuff that should inform your designs has obviously been done before, uh, the, before this process starts. Uh, and then we also obviously do uh, information architecture. We could do something like style tiles. Um, so that kind of process goes before prototyping. But once we move into actually uh, prototyping, uh, we tend to have kind of these uh, rapid iterations. So we talk to the client at least once a week. We have like a meeting. Um, maybe uh, two times a week. And we do this remote as well. It doesn't have to be an in-person meeting. Uh, so at least uh, once a week we have uh, meetings and kind of um, talk through the, the changes that have been done. So it's almost like, you know, continuous sprints. All right, so, um, okay, so last question, yes?
Is, is, sorry, I didn't catch that. I think I think there's not like a clear answer to that. I think how this methodology came came about. I think uh, for like the design perspective, it came about because we had a lot of designers that wanted to work with more and more with interaction design, and we had a lot of front-end developers that were kind of frustrated uh, with not you know getting enough information about the thoughts uh, behind uh, behind um, kind of the the interfaces. You can only read so much from like a user story or something like that. Um, so. By kind of moving our front-end developers and our designers closer together, uh, we've kind of been able to, to bridge that gap, I think. So that's kind of what, what brought on this change in, in methodology. So we have to get uh, moving with, uh, with the next section. So um, I just want to walk you through the setup that we're using right now at uh, FFW and kind of the, some of the technologies. So um, we, uh, we use these six technologies in the prototyping setup that we're using uh, right now. And I don't want to go through all of them right now. We don't have uh, time to do that. But um, a lot of you are probably familiar with the Node.js and the Node Package Manager. We use that for managing all our dependencies so we can just easily start a new project by just installing that. We have Bower in there, which is a package manager for front-end libraries, which also kind of pulls in um, some of the dependencies we have there. Uh, we're using SAS as a CSS process, uh, preprocessor. So for it's kind of an extension to the CSS language that allows us to do things like uh, loops and variables and stuff like that. Uh, we, we're using a grid system called SUSE, which is a really, really great SAS-based uh, grid system that allows you to do pretty much anything. Um, it's really flexible and, and uh, in our experience has worked uh, nicely with, with Drupal as well. But the two technologies that I want to talk about today are Gulp um, and Tweak. So Gulp JS is a build system and a task automation system uh, that we're using in our prototype setup. Uh, and maybe you can't see it that clearly, but uh, what we're looking at now is the Gulp file of our project. So the Gulp file pulls in all of the different dependencies we're using um, and automates a lot of different tasks for us. So. Um, some of the things we're doing with Gulp is we're starting a static server uh, with a live reloading. So we're watching files for changes and running tasks whenever something changes. So whenever a file changes, we're automatically reloading the browsers and you can open it up. Uh, you get like an external URL as well, so you can open it up on all your different devices in the device lab and, and look at, uh, at the site as you're designing. Uh, so we compile the SCSS files. We automatically add vendor pre prefixes. We generate source maps. Um, we compile the Twig templates that we're using to HTML, and we automatically include uh, data with these templates. So uh, that's all well and good, but what's really important, like the important point here is that Gulp is set up to automate all of this for us. So our designers really, uh, they don't have to worry about this. That's the point, uh, because all of this is like front-end technology stuff, and we don't want our designers to worry about this. Um, so this is all automated. Um, so our designers only have to worry about this if something breaks, and thankfully uh, that doesn't happen too often. So uh, it's, a, it's a really nice, uh, Gulp adds like a, a really nice level of automation. So the other technology is uh, Twig. And um, as you've probably heard here at DrupalCon, Twig is gonna be part of uh, Drupal 8. Uh, but we've been using Twig as our template engine for, for uh, a while. And um, the great thing about Twig and uh, really any template engine is that it allows us to do all these kind of things like output and escape and filter data. It allows some kind of presentation logic like conditionals and loops. Uh, we can define and overwrite blocks and we can do includes and extend templates. So all of these things are things that again the designers uh, working with this they have to learn but it's a lot easier than learning like uh, how to do these things in PHP. So, um, so that's really great. It's, uh, that works uh, nicely. So especially things like um, especially things like includes, we have an include up here if you can't read that. Uh, that's really important and, uh, because it allows us to kind of split things into to components. So take the navigation out of there, just a really standard example. Um, but something that really makes it easy for our designers to understand this modular way of working as well. Um, we do things like, you know, extends. So we build a basic layout template with, you know, 
the head and, and any footer styles that are going to be on every page, and then we just extend that. So when we design new pages, it's really easy to just extend that basic layout page, and our designers can worry about building out you know, the, the bulk of, of these pages. But the most interesting thing, really, is that it allows us to create these components. So it allows us to actually move away from thinking just in pages, thinking web design, uh, design as pages. It allows us to work uh, much more in kind of a modular way. So for every, uh, every kind of block file we have, we can have also uh, an SCSS file that kind of correlates with this. So we have to get these really nice modular um, these components that it's really easy to also reuse later in development. And it's a nice way to think about it, that you're not designing uh, pages. You're not designing 10 different templates, web pages. Obviously, you're also doing that. But the way to think about it is to kind of to break it down into a design system. So you're designing components in a system. Um, obviously, that also um, allows us to do things like uh, set up a style guide that kind of shows all of these uh, various components that we've designed. Um, and actually, today, the way we're doing it is kind of, uh, I'm going to call it semi-manual. So we have like a style guide file set up that uh, outputs all of the things that we know we use in every project, like typography and these things. And then we manually add in new components that we're using. But there are some great technologies out there that can automate for it. And there was actually a really interesting talk yesterday about uh, KSS uh, and uh, KSS Node and actually using that with uh, Twig to automatically generate style guides. Um, so we're, we're definitely looking into adding that to, to our, uh, our framework. So to kind of sum up, uh, I would say that all of this really comes together in, in a, a framework that works really nicely for our designers. So to kind of get started with a project, they just type gulp in the terminal. So they don't have, they don't have to mess around too much in the, in the terminal. They just type gulp and we're off. You know, and every time we, uh, they change something in the design, it automatically gets updated. And you know, they just have to really worry about the SCSS and the Twig templates and everything else kind of gets done for them. All right, that's the prototyping setup. So uh, any quick questions before we move on to Drupal 7? Yep. Uh, so I think some designers find it more difficult than others. I think it really depends on, on where you're, you're kind of uh, coming from. But I would say, obviously, the, some of the major challenges, obviously, are that designers have to, to care about and learn uh, some of these uh, technologies, at least basic uh, HTML and CSS. Obviously, that's a new requirement, and that's obviously a challenge, uh, um, because it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of a requirement in order to be able to work uh, this way. I mean, you can work really closely with a front-end developer, but you have to know at least a, a little bit about markup and, and styling. Um, so that's a major challenge. The other way around, it's also a challenge uh, to kind of make sure that everything is aligned and ready for, for implementing. Because obviously, uh, we need to involve the front-end developers in the process as well, and they have to care also deeply about, about the design aspect. So obviously, I think the major challenge is bringing these two, um, these two different kind of skill sets together and making them work together nicely. Um, that, that, that obviously can have some, some challenges. But overall, I'd say it, it Generally, people want to work together, obviously, to create the best possible solution. I mean, that's probably why we're all here. We like creating great websites. Uh, so I think generally it works out nicely. Yeah, so we've actually, uh, obviously, we haven't done that extensively yet, but we've done a few, uh, a few kind of test drives at that. And it's working out nicely. Um, and uh, Yuri is going to talk a little bit more about, about that. Yep, last question here. Uh, good question. Uh, the answer is it depends. Uh, but uh, obviously we, we often start out with doing content strategy and defining content uh, almost kind of simultaneously as we're starting up the, um, the uh, information architecture and starting up with, uh, with design. So we use as much real content as we can basically. So we do these includes of JSON files with all of our templates, uh, so we can just add in some, some data there and, and output it in the, in the templates as well. Uh, but obviously there are projects where we're not able to do it that way. 
Um, just like it would be with, with static mockups. Sometimes you don't have that content available, so you have to use uh, placeholders and lorem ipsum and stuff like that. But it's not optimal. We prefer to use real content. So uh, we might have time for more questions later, but I'm going to uh, hand it over to uh, Yuri now. I would like to give some comments from developer's perspective how usually project goes. So before we started the implementation of this process, our team was really had a, this split, like we kick off the project with the client and then designers comes in and then like in few months, we are going to be amazed what is going to get into development. And especially when you have designers who are com coming from non-website background, like they didn't have experience with designing for the web, the best ones are from publishing where everything should be like pixel perfect and ideal. That's where trouble starts. So, and um, there's another problem when we start implementing things is that front-end developers, they just start screaming right away when they understand like what they get designs and when they get the data of the Drupal and they know what output of the Drupal is and like how much they need to work on the things to make them nice. So it's very good in this um, workflow when front-end developers, they engage way earlier and they start telling back-end developers like what data we need and how things are going to work. And uh, what I will talk about is actually, the f we, we were coming up with these ideas like way earlier, like I don't know, three, four years ago when we get these huge problems in the end of the project, when we had front-end developers rewriting the whole CSS files multiple times because they just grown like 10, 20,000 lines, and it's like not the limit, of course. And um, we were thinking like, okay, but in development we have also similar things. Like we can go really wild, not thinking about the future and all architecture can be banned, and that's what we do. We rewrite, refactor everything. So how to solve that issue? And this is something that we come up with, but when after this talk you will start talking to your developers, like, 100% they will resist. Because the ideal scenario for backend developers is like, here is your data, like, and now you do it, and now you make it beautiful, and we don't care, right? This is the views, you have five templates to override, I don't care, like, you just have your own thing. And if you need some more data, like, no problems, here's another view, another block, like, just like, we have all our backend development, performance, like third party integrations, we are too busy to handle that stuff. And um, no worries, I'm not going to talk, I'm not going to teach you some bad language how to speak with developers so they will cool down. But there are some tricks in Drupal that make this little bit easier for them to understand like, yes, it's like completely different HTML, but it's not end of the world and we actually can implement it and uh, we do not say to client, oh, backend development is two times more. So that's not going to happen. So um, some things that I will talk about is some modules, and I expect you to be a little bit familiar about Drupal ecosystem, about some modules that we're using. So uh, we will talk about panels, views, some view modes about entities, and JavaScript. Of course. So, panels. Uh, we have the standard, we landed to be a standard using panels for all our layouts. And this is very handy because you can have a layout, you have full control of it, you can put some more blocks in different areas, and it's very nice for developers, uh, pretty bad for clients to manage the site if, they, if you let them go to the panels um, backend. But still it's manageable with all this inline panels editor and all that stuff. What is important when you start um, implementing Drupal site and you have these prototypes? So one of important thing is actually to do the inventory. And this is something that actually good designers do. They come up with style guides, right? They have all these different kind of like, these are the buttons, these are type of buttons, these are blocks, these are layouts sometimes. So you can understand what kind of layouts you need to build in, in your backend. 
Um, another thing, like what type of blocks you need to build, because in, in the back end, of course, we have flexibility. We can, depending on conditions, we can have either one layout or the other layout or one type of block or the other. So we have no problems with that, but it's a very bad idea to create one block with 50 different types of output and uh, same with layouts. I mean, it's fine if you have like one, two different layouts depending on condition for the same page, but if it grows, you really need to go for different layouts. Um, and uh, this is something that we start off when we start developing. So, for example, we have this kind of part of the page and uh, like in conventional development, what we say, okay, okay, the bottom list is a view, we can assemble the view pretty fast and then uh, top left block is also a view and there is another block, yes, that's uh, going to be paints and we are going to display everything with views. When we do the uh, when we have prototypes, we actually implement them as custom panes. So we display every single piece of the content as the custom paint to lower down number of templates. This is the key element of implementation because like if you think about views and you will need to implement some very fancy HTML that is very easy to theme but it's very custom you will probably need to override at least three, four templates in field mode. And um, when you will have like I mean, 30 views, you need to do that, you will have like huge number of templates. And the whole idea of working with panels and views is actually, and, and custom panes, is actually to lower down those number. So in this scenario, we would build also three blocks, but each of them are going to be panes. And we do use views, but we render them in a little bit different way. For the panels, when you create a custom panes, these blocks, what is important is that you need to use templates for every single time you do theming. So when you render something, just please create a template. The, like there are two ways of theming in Drupal. You can either create a function somewhere in your code or you can create a template. Like please use templates. It's so much better for front-end developers, especially because they have tweaked templates or they can, if, if it's rendered as the HTML, they can just copy paste and then change something instead of like putting that into your separate module file and then it should be somewhere in the code, they need to find it. So it's much better for maintenance. Another thing is when you create the custom pane, please place the template files inside of the folder where you actually prepare the data for that pane. So in that case, you understand like, okay, I need to change that pane a little bit, the output, I go to the panels interface, I know the name of that pane, and then immediately in the code I find both where I prepare the data for that pane and where I render it. I can see the template. For that, oh, maybe you won't be able to see this. So uh, the trick part that is like documented, but not that well, in uh, plugging definition of your content pane, you need to identify the hook theme, and then you, will, you can tell the Drupal that template file is in the folder within the same file of pane definition. Probably this is something that you should point to your, your developers too when they will start working with this thing. And regarding views, views are great. They are very flexible. Uh, we really love to use them, but rendering, like, we try to keep ourselves out. So in the custom panes, we just execute them to get the results, but then we render them in the way we like. So in this way, this is some snippet of the code that we use. So when we need to have view results, we just execute them programmatically. We get results, we actually load the nodes when uh, that we were getting as results, and then we theme them with node view function. So that is another trick that we found very handy to avoid all these multiple templates in uh, theming views. Another thing is display modes for entities. So um, entities, let's talk about nodes mainly. So by default, nodes in Drupal, they have full view, teaser view, uh, RSS search, but like not that many. Right, and uh, in our real life websites, when we have lists, we have multiple types of lists with different type of HTML. I mean, the same node can look very different in different lists. So this is where we try to 
um, we try to use view mode, and that means that in the list we just create a new a new type, like it can be teaser archive or teaser search or teaser listing news or something that will identify what listing this content is going to be displayed at and then we just have separate template for each list. It's actually very similar that you're going to build in prototypes, you're going just to use the same template for all of the listings and this is what we are trying to use as well. So in this case of course the number of templates will grow but they are still pretty easy to manage because you know the how you name the templates, you know, okay, this is the, uh, we usually name them like node and content type and then some kind of identifier where the list is. Usually it's like views name. So in this way we can easily find the template for that particular view. And it's very important to also keep very good order of your templates in your theme. So what we usually do, we have template folder in the theme and then we have different type of entities like uh, file entity, uh, fillable panel panes, nodes, it can be taxonomy terms, like different types. And then we go with even more elements in hierarchy. In this case, it's article like content type. So you will come up with your own system, that's for sure. But this is very important to think up front before you start developing. JavaScript. Um, this is something that gets pretty tricky if you let your front-end developers to go too far because like they will like to use some fancy JavaScript frameworks that Drupal has no compatibility even. Um, what we try to do, because the front-end developer will take responsibility for delivering the project, they need to remember what versions of like jQuery, what JavaScript in Drupal should be available and they shouldn't conflict. So as the general rule, we ask front-end developers to remember include Drupal.js. This is the one that uses Drupal behaviors and also wrap all the JavaScript they built in Drupal behaviors to be at least closer to be compatible to Drupal code. It doesn't mean that it will not change. It will definitely change, especially if there are some things like Ajax that you use like core framework for the Ajax calls and all these forms out of submits. This kind of things um, usually get rewritten when they start being implemented in Drupal. But still, when you have at least these basics, uh, code will be much better shape. You will not need to rewrite that much. Some advantages of prototype-based approach when you're not using Drupal. So we had experience of building website, like part of the website in Silex, and Silex is the micro framework built on Symfony components and some others, and it uses Twig. And it was like a miracle for us, really. We just like grabbed the templates from prototypes, put them in Silex, like little modification there, like in two, three hours we were able to assemble the whole page with all the data with everything. That will never happen probably in Drupal in the nearest future, but if you are planning to build something in other systems, prototype-based approach is even way better than designing in Photoshop. It, it just like works, if you, if you have tweak support, of course. Drupal 8. Uh, this is something that we don't have like real life experience, we're just starting working with Drupal 8. Things that we know uh, will be more better to support this model is of course Twig because we are going to use the Twig templates. I have huge doubts about using them as is. Probably we will need to modify them. And um, it's still not known for us what is the template structure in Drupal 8 going to be. So I think after a couple of projects our way of prototyping will change. So we will change the structure so it will fit closer to Drupal structure but this is something where collaboration will be great. Um, JavaScript, uh, Drupal 8 supports more modern versions of everything and it has like backbone and other things. So I think it really will be much better, but I'm very eager to start some Drupal 8 projects and experiment with them and update this slide. This is it for me. Do you have any questions? Yes, please. Uh, can you tell us more about the way you use the template? 
Uh, the question is about the way we serve pages. Ah, panel panes. So when we assemble the page, we have two things. So the general layout is usually controlled by panels everywhere. So it's like the first part. This is where I usually have like header footer, right? The second level is actually panels, and it can be either panel pages or panelized nodes. And then we, when we go to the paints, actually all of them are usually custom paints that we define in the code. So we don't use anything, for, well, we use, but it's very low. We, we don't use much of the things that are coming from the panels themselves. We don't use like standard paints from panels or page manager or C tools. We just build them on our own in order to control the templates. Does this answer? Okay, so uh, for the content editors, they find this setup really great. Uh, like, no jokes. Like, when we start giving them panelized nodes with multiple variants of layout, like what you can do in Panelizer, and also they can go into, like, edit mode and add any paints they like, and they know which paints are there, and we also can limit the options, they find it, like, yes, it's the best CMS ever, and, like, <laughs> thumbs up, it's so much better than all things we had previously. So it, it works really well. Also, of course, it's a matter of education because like you give more flexibility to the customers. You need to educate them not to put the huge block in the sidebar and it will crash the whole layout. But in general, it's a much more flexible approach and clients really appreciate it. Yes, please. So performance, like theoretically, right? Views got several elements in the pipe when they're being rendered. So the first one is actually execution. And this is what we do in custom paints as well, right? And then we go into, and, and we have a cache based on execution. We can cache results for the view depending on arguments and so forth. No, it's in views configuration. We don't change that. And then we have a view rendering and we skip all that part. So instead of collecting and discovering like what templates to use and there are like four or five of them, we don't do that at all. We just render it from one theming function. So it should be more performant. Also because it's custom paints, also because it's custom paints, we have much more, we, we still have all that granular control over caching. I mean, if there are anything that is going to be slow, we will control it from our caching and we can purge it ourselves. So like performance tuning is not the issue because you have a lot of custom code that controls all the elements. Yeah, panels, performance, um, yes, but it's still, if there are any troubles, we have knowledge, we can add layers of caching. So, um, I, we, in our experience, we didn't have any, any performance issues with, with using this approach. And it doesn't matter whether you render just a view in the panel. I mean, panel themselves can have some issues. Views themselves can have some issues, but we don't skip any caching layer. And if we even skip, we can easily add it. Other questions, please? Yes, please. So why we use view modes of entities, right? Instead of fields, right? Ah, okay. So the question is, why don't we use display suite 
uh, for rendering view modes, and instead we do that in the code in templates, right? Um, the reason is for maintenance, for more convenient uh, changing it in uh, for front-end developers. Because if you have some configuration in display suite, yes, you have layout, but you also have what fields are there and how they are going to be displayed. If front-end developer, for example, will need to change the order, he will need to find that element in display suite to change the order. He needs to make sure, maybe if some small changes, he needs to go to layout. So there are like multiple places where you control the way it's going to be displayed. In our case, we decided just to go with plain templates because it's something that they are already using in prototypes. And this is where things just click together. And I mean, if your front-end developers are comfortable with display suite, well, I mean, it's a great module, like use it. We have decided to switch to like more templates, but it's still manageable and everyone understands where to find them. Yes, please. So the question is, do we think if we are going to keep using panels in Drupal 8? Uh, that's probably, answer will come up when we will have panels and we will start implementations. Right now, I know there is a page manager that you can use. The really thing that we need and we use very heavily is panelizer. I know it's not there yet, but we will see. I mean, it's just, just the beginning. Yes, please. Um, so the question is about using some Adobe product instead of designing in uh, CSS and in, in browser. And ah, okay, and outputs. So this is something uh, related to some questions to Morton. So when we get the HTML from these programs, I mean, it's maybe good in browser, but it's really not production ready thing. I mean, all the point of creating it manually, I mean, all the designing in browser, it's kind of optimization of the way CSS JavaScript is structured and built. And if we skip this step, I mean, it doesn't matter. We will still need to rewrite because CSS files can grow big. And all the point of this approach from developer perspective is to make that as nice architecture as to build the backend. So at least for now, I haven't seen any solutions that were just like, wow, that's like same level of quality that our front end developer can do. So uh, we haven't, s haven't done anything with that. Yes, please. So, so things like menus, it's like exactly the same thing like we do with views. So the question is about what we do with menus, right? When we need to override them. So we just load the menu in the back end. We have all the elements in array and then just render them in the way we like. So we, we, we don't go too much with the standard block that renders menu. We just create our custom pane and render menu in the way we like. Any other questions? Thank you very much. It has been a great pleasure here. So if, uh, if there are any more questions, you're free to come up and talk to us now. We'll stay here for a while. Otherwise, you can come down to our booth, uh, 501, and uh, ask more questions later. Thank you.